Disclaimer. This book may contain content that is considered historically inaccurate or culturally insensitive by modern standards. My hope is that by exploring old literature, we will better understand why people of the past thought the way that they did and understand the influences that shaped their culture. This video is not intended for young audiences. Hi, I'm Morgan, and today I will be reading from Myths from Many Lands. And it was from, I believe, a publication called The Children's Hour, or a book series called The Children's Hour. This is the, I believe, the second volume in that set. And it was published by Houghton Mifflin Co. in 1907. And right now we are reading um, one of the myths from Greece and Rome. And it is called The Chimera by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Once in the old, old times, for all the strange things which I tell you about happened long before anybody can remember, a fountain gushed out of a hillside in the marvelous land of Greece, and, for aught I know, after so many thousand years, it is still gushing out of the very selfsame spot. At any rate, there was the pleasant fountain, welling freshly forth and sparkling adown the hillside in the golden sunset, when a handsome young man named Bellerophon drew near its margin. In his hand he held a bridle, studded with brilliant gems, and adorned with a golden bit. Seeing an old man, and another of middle age, and a little boy near the fountain, and likewise a maiden, who was dipping up some of the water in a pitcher, he paused, and begged that he might refresh himself with a draught. "'This is very delicious water,' he said to the maiden, as he rinsed and filled her pitcher, after drinking out of it. "'Will you be kind enough to tell me whether the fountain has a na any name?' Yes, it is called the Fountain of Pyrene, answered the maiden, and then she added, My grandmother has told me that this clear fountain was once a beautiful woman, and when her son was killed by the arrows of, of the huntress Diana, she melted all away into tears. And so the water, which you find so cool and sweet, is the sorrow of that poor mother's heart. I should not have dreamed, observed the young stranger, that so clear a wellspring with its gush and gurgle, and its cheery dance out of the shade into the sunlight, had so much as one teardrop in its bosom. And this, then, is Pyrene? I thank you, pretty maiden, for telling me its name. I have come from a faraway country to find this very spot. A middle-aged country fellow, he had driven his cow dr to drink out of the spring, stared hard at young at young Bellerophon, and at his hand, and at the handsome bridle which he carried in his hand. The water courses must be getting low, friend, in your part of the world, remarked he, if you come so far only to find the fountain of Pyrene. But, pray, have you lost a horse? I see you carry the bridle in your hand, and a very pretty one it is, with that double row of bright stones upon it. If the horse was, a fi was as fine as the bridle, you are much to be pitied for losing him. I have lost no horse, said Bellerophon, with a smile, but I happen to be seeking a very famous one, which, as wise people have informed me, must be found hereabouts, if anywhere. Do you know whether the winged horse Pegasus still haunts the fountain of Pyrene, as he used to do in your forefathers' days? But then the country fellow laughed. <laughs> Some of you, my little friends, have probably heard that this Pegasus was a snow-white steed with a beautiful silvery wings who spent most of his time, time on the summit of Mount Helicon. He was, a, he was as wild and as swift and as buoyant in its flight through the air as any eagle that ever soared into the clouds. There was nothing else like him in the world. He had no mate. He never had been backed or bridled by a master, and, for many a long year, he led a solitary and a happy life. Oh, how fine a thing it is to be a winged horse, sleeping at night, as he did, on a lofty mountain top, and passing the greater part of the day in the air. Pegasus, Pegasus seemed hardly to be a creature of the earth. Whenever he was seen, up very high above people's heads, with the sunshine on his silvery wings, you would have thought that he belonged to the sky, and that, skimming a little too low, he had got astray among our mists and vapors, and was seeking his way back again. It was very pretty to behold him plunge into the fleecy, into the fleecy bosom of a bright cloud, and to be lost in it for a moment or two, and then break forth from the other side. 
or in a solemn rainstorm, when the when there was a gray pavement of clouds over the whole sky, it would sometimes happen that the winged horse descended right through it, and the glad light and the glad light of the upper region would gleam after him. In another instant, it is true, both Pegasus and the pleasant light would be gone away together. But any one that was fortunate enough to see this wondrous spectacle felt cheerful the whole day afterwards, and as much longer as the storm lasted. In the summer time, and in the beautifulest of weather, Pegasus often, often alighted on the solid earth, and, closing his silvery wings, would gallop over hill and dale for pastime as fleetly as the wind. Oftener than in any other place, he, he had been seen near the fountain of Pyrene, drinking the delicious water, or rolling himself upon the soft grass of the margin. Sometimes, too, but Pegasus was very, very dainty in his food, he would crop a few of the clover blossoms that happened to be the sweetest. To the fountain of Pyrene, therefore, people's great-grandfathers had been in the habit of going, as long as they were youthful, and retained their faith in winged horses, in hopes of getting a glimpse of the beautiful Pegasus. But of late years he had been very seldom seen. Indeed, there were many of the country folks, dwelling within half an hour's walk of the fountain, who had never beheld Pegasus, and did not believe that there were that there was any such creature in existence. The country fellow to whom Bellerophon was speaking chanced to be one of those incredulous persons, and that was the reason why he laughed. Pegasus, indeed, cried he, turning up his nose as high as such a flat nose could be turned up. Pegasus, indeed, a winged horse, truly? My friend, are you in your senses? Of what use would wings be to a horse? Could he drag the plow so well, thank you? To be sure, there might be a little saving in the expense of shoes, but then how would a man like to see his horse flying out of the stable window? Yes, or whisking him up above the clouds, when he only wanted to ride to, ride to mill. No, no, I don't believe in Pegasus. There never was such a ridiculous kind of a horse foul maid. I have some reason to think otherwise, said Bellerophon quietly, and then he turned to an old gray man who was leaning on a staff and listening very attentively with his head stretched forward and one hand at his ear because for the last twenty years he had been getting rather deaf. And what say you, venerable sir, inquired he, in your younger days? I should imagine. You must frequently have seen the winged steed. Ah, young stranger, my memory is very poor, said the aged man. When I was a lad, if I remember rightly, I used to believe there was such a horse, and so did everybody else. But nowadays I hardly know what to think, and very seldom think about the winged horse at all. If I ever saw the creature, it was a long, long while ago, and, to tell you the truth, I doubt whether I ever did see him. One day, to be sure, when I was quite a youth, I remember seeing some hoof tramps round about the brink of the fountain. Pegasus might have made those hoof marks, and so might, and so might some other horse. And have you never seen him, my fair maiden? asked Bellerophon of the girl, who stood with a pitcher on her head while he while this talk went on. You certainly could see Pegasus, if anybody can, for your eyes are very bright. Once I thought I saw him, replied the maiden, with a smile and a blush. It was either Pegasus or a large white bird, a very great great way up in the air. And at one time and at one other time, as I was coming to the fountain with my pitcher, I heard a neigh. Oh, such a brisk and melodious neigh as that was. My very heart leapt with, a, with a delight at the sound. But it startled me, nevertheless, so that I ran home without filling my pitcher. That was truly a pity, said Bellerophon. And he turned to the child, whom I mentioned at the beginning of the story, and who was gazing at him, as children are apt to, do, apt to gaze at strangers, with his rosy mouth wide open. Why, my little fellow, cried Bellerophon, playfully pulling one of his curls, I suppose you have often seen the winged horse. That I have, answered.
answered the child very readily. I saw him yesterday and many times before. You are a fine little man, said Bellerophon, drawing the child closer to him. Come, tell me all about it. Why, replied the child, I often come here to sail little boats in the fountain and to gather pretty pebbles out of its basin. And sometimes, when I look down into the water, I see the image of the winged horse and the picture of the sky that is there. I wish he would come down and take me on his back and let me ride him up to the moon. But if I so much as stir to look at him, he flies far away out of sight. And Bellerophon put his faith into the chalk put his faith in the child who had seen the image of Peg Pegasus in the water and in the maiden who had heard him neigh so melodiously rather than in the middle-aged clown who believed only in cart horses or in the old man who had forgotten the beautiful things of his youth. Therefore, he haunted about the fountain of Pyrene for a great many days afterwards. He kept continually on the watch, looking upward at the sky or else down into the water, hoping forever that he should see either the reflected image of the winged horse or the marvelous reality. He held the bridle with its bright gems and golden bit, always ready in his hand. The rustic people who dwelt in the neighborhood and drove their cattle to the fountain to drink would often laugh at poor Bellerophon and sometimes take him pretty severely to task. They told him that an able-bodied young man, like himself, ought to have better business than to be wasting his time in such an idle pursuit. They offered to sell him a horse if he wanted one, and when Bellerophon declined the purchase, they tried to drive a bargain with him for his fine bridle. Even the country boys thought him so very foolish that they used to have a great deal of sport about him, and were rude enough not to care a fig, although Bellerophon saw and heard it. One little urchin, for example, would play Pegasus and cut the, odd, cut the oddest imaginable capers by way of flying, while one of his schoolfellows would scamper after him, holding forth a twist of bulrushes, which was intended to represent Bellerophon's ornamental bridle. But the gentle child who had seen the picture of Pegasus in the water comforted the young stranger more than all the naughty boys could torment him. The dear little fellow, in his play hours, often sat down beside him and, without speaking a word, would look down into the fountain and up towards the sky with so innocent a face that Bellerophon could not help feeling encouraged. Now you will, perhaps, wish to be told why it was that Bellerophon had undertaken to catch the winged horse and we shall find no better opportunity to speak about this matter than while he is waiting for Pegasus to appear. If I were to relate the whole of Bellerophon's previous adventures, they might easily grow into a very long story. It will be quite enough to say that, in a certain country of Asia, a terrible monster called a Chimera had made its appearance and was doing more mischief than could be talked about between now and sunset. According to the best accounts which I have been able to obtain, the Chimera was nearly, if not quite, the ugliest and most poisonous creature, and the strangest and unaccountablest, and the hardest to fight with, and the most difficult to run away from, that ever came out of the earth's inside. It had a tail like a boa constrictor. Its body was like I do not care what, and it had had three separate heads, one of which was a lion's, the second a goat's, and the third an abominably great snake's. And a hot blast of fire came flaming out of each of its three mouths. Being an earthly, an earthly monster, I doubt whether it had any wings, but wings or no, it ran like a goat and a lion, and wriggled along like a serpent, and thus contrived to make about as much speed as all three together. Oh, the mischief, and mischief, and mischief that this naughty creature did! With its flaming breath, it could set a forest on fire, or burn up a field of grain, or, for that matter, a village with all its fences and houses. It laid waste to the whole country round about it. Round about it. Oh, dear, this page is having an issue. Round, um, it laid waste the whole country round about, and used to eat up people and animals alive, and cook them afterwards in the burning oven of its stomach. 
Mercy on us, little children. I hope neither you nor I will ever happen to meet a chimera. Well, the hateful beast, if a beast we can anyways call it, was doing all these horrible things. It so chanced that Bellerophon came to that part of the world on a visit to the king. The king's name was Iobates, and, and Lycia was the country which he ruled over. Bellerophon was one of the bravest youths in the world, and desired nothing so much as to do some valiant and benefi beneficent deed, such as would make all mankind admire and love him. In those days, the only way for a young man to distinguish himself was by fighting battles, either with the enemies of his country, or with wicked giants, or with troublesome dragons, or with wild beasts, when he could find nothing more dangerous to encounter. King Iobates, perceiving the, cur the courage of his youthful visitor, proposed to him to go and fight the Chimera, which everybody else was afraid of, and which, unless it should be soon killed, was likely to convert Lycia into a desert. Bellerophon hesitated not a moment, but assured the king that he would either slay this dreaded Chimera or perish in the attempt. But, in the first place, as the monster was so prodigiously swift, he bethought himself that he should never win the victory by fighting on foot. The wisest thing he could do, therefore, was to go get the very best and fleetest horse that could anywhere be found. And what other horse in all the world was half so fleet as the marvelous horse Pegasus, who had wings as well as legs, and was even more active in the air than on earth, than on the earth. To be sure, a great many people denied that there was any such horse with wings, and said that the stories about him were all poetry and nonsense. But, wonderful as it appeared, Bellerophon believed that Pegasus was a real steed, and hoped that he himself might be fortunate enough to find him, and, once fairly mounted on his back, he would be able to fight the Chimera at better advantage. And this was the purpose with which he had traveled from Lycia to Greece, and had brought brought the beautifully ornamented bridle in his hand. It was an enchanted bridle. If he could only be succeed in putting the golden bit into the mouth of Pegasus, the winged horse would be submissive, and would own Bel Bellerophon for his master, and fly with whithersoever he might choose to turn the rein. But, indeed, it was a weary and anxious time, while Bellerophon waited and waited for Pegasus, in hopes that he would come and drink at the fountain of Pyrene. He was afraid lest King Iobates should, t should imagine that he had fled from the Chimera. It pained him, too, to think how much mischief the monster was doing, while he himself, instead of fighting with it, was compelled to sit idly poring over the bright waters of Pyrene as they gushed out of the sparkling sand. And as Pegasus came came thither so seldom in these latter years, and scarcely alighted there more than once in a lifetime, Bellerophon feared that he might grow an old man, and have no strength left in his arms nor courage in his heart, before the winged horse would appear. Oh, how heavily, how heavily passes the time, while an adventurous youth is yearning to do his part in life, and to gather in the harvest of his renown. How hard a lesson it is to wait. Our life is brief, and how much of it is spent in teaching us only this. Well was it for Bellerophon that the gentle child had grown so fond of him, and was never weary of keeping him company. Every morning the child gave him a new hope to put into his bosom, instead of yesterday's withered one. Dear Bellerophon, he would cry, looking up hopefully into his face, I think we shall see Pegasus today. And, at length, if it had not been for the little boy's unwavering faith, Bellerophon would have given up all hope and would have gone back to Lycia and be, and have done his best to slay the Chimera without the help of the winged horse. And in that case, poor Bellerophon would at least have been terribly scor scorched by the creature's breath and would most probably have been killed and devoured. Nobody should ever try to fight an earthborn Chimera unless he can first get upon the back of an aerial steed. One morning the child spoke to Bellerophon, even more hopefully than usual. Dear, dear Bellerophon, cried he, I know not why it is, but I feel as if we should certainly see Pegasus today. And all that day he would not stir a step from Bellerophon's side, so they ate a crust of bread together and drank some of the water of the fountain. 
In the afternoon, there they sat, and Bellerophon had thrown his arm around the child, who likewise had put one of his little hands in, into Bellerophon's. The latter was lost in his own thoughts, and was fixing his eyes vacantly on the trunks of the trees that overshadowed the fountain, and on the grapevines that clambered up among their branch branches. But the gentle child was gazing down into the water. He was grieved, for Bellerophon's sake, that the hope of another day should be deceived, like so many before it, and two or three quiet teardrops fell from his eyes, and mingled with what were said to be the many tears of Pyrene when she wept for her slain children. But when he least thought of it, Bellerophon felt the pressure of the child's little hand, and heard a soft, almost breathless whisper, See there! Dear Bellerophon, there is an image in the water! The young man looked down into the dimpling mirror of the fountain and saw what he took to be the great and saw what he took to be the reflection of a bird which seemed to be flying at a great height in the air with a gleam of sunshine on its snowy or silvery wings. What a splendid bird it must be, said he, and how very large it looks, though it must really be flying higher than the clouds. It makes me tremble whispered the child. I am afraid to look up into the air. It is very beautiful, and yet I dare only look at its image in the water. Dear Bellerophon, do you not see that this is, that it is no bird? It is the winged horse, Pegasus. Bellerophon's heart began to throb. He gazed keenly upward, but could not see the winged creature, whether bird or horse, because, just then, it had plunged into the fleecy depths of a summer cloud. It was but a moment, however, before the object reappeared, sinking lightly down out of the, out of the cloud, although still, of, still at a vast distance from the earth. Bellerophon caught the child in his arms, and shrank back with him, so that they were both hidden among the, th the thick the thick shrubbery which grew all around the fountain. Not that he was afraid of any harm, but he dreaded lest, if Pegasus caught a glimpse of them, he would fly far away and alight in some inaccessible mountain top, for it was really the winged horse. After they had expected him so long, he was coming to quench his thirst with the water of Pyrene. Nearer and nearer came the aerial wonder, flying in great circles, as you may have seen a dove with when about to alight. Downward came Pegasus, and those wide, sweeping circles, which grew narrower and narrower still, as he gradually approached the earth. The nigher the view of him, the more beautiful he was, and the more marvelous the sweep of his silvery wings. At last, with so light a pressure as hardly to bend them, mend the grass about the fountain, or imprint a hoof trap in the sand of its margin, he lighted, and stooping his wild head, began to drink. He drew in the water with long and pleasant sighs, and tranquil pauses of enjoyment, and then another draught, and another, and another, for nowhere in the world, or up among the clouds, did Pegasus love any water, water as he loved this of Pyrene, and when his thirst was, was slaked, he, and when his thirst was slacked, he cropped a few of the honey blossoms of the clover, delicately tasting them, but not caring to make a hearty meal, because the herbage just beneath the clouds, on the lofty sides of Mount Helicon, suited his palate better than, than, better than this ordinary grass. After thus drinking to his heart's content, and in his dainty fashion condescending to take a little food, the winged horse began to caper to and fro, and dance, as it were, out of mere idleness and sport. There never was a more playful creature made than this very, than this very Pegasus. So there he frisked, in a way that it delights me to think about, fluttering his great wings as lightly as ever did a linnet, and running little races, half on earth and half in, half in air, in which I know not whether to call a flight or a gallop. When a creature is perfectly able to fly, he sometimes chooses to run, just for the pastime of the thing. And so did Pegasus, although it cost him some little trouble to keep his hoofs so near the ground. Bellerophon, meanwhile, holding the child's hand, peeped from forth from the shrubbery, and thought that never was any sight so beautiful as this, nor ever a horse's eyes so wild and spirited as those of Pegasus. It seemed a sin to think of bridling him and riding on his back. Once or twice, Pegasus stopped and snuffed the air, 
prick, pricking up his ears, tossing his head, and turning it on all sides, as if he partly suspected some mischief or other. Seeing nothing, however, and hearing no sound, he soon began his antics again. At length, not that he was weary, but only idle and luxurious, Pegasus folded his wings and lay down on the soft green turf, but, being too full of aerial life to remain quiet for many moments together, he soon rolled over on his back, with his four slender legs in the air. It was beautiful to see him, this one solitary creature, whose mate had never been created, but who needed no companion, and, living a great many hundred years, was as happy as the centuries were long. The more he did such things as mortal horses were accustomed to do, the less earthly and the more wonderful he seemed. Bellerophon and the child almost held their breath, partly from a delightful awe, but still more because they dreaded lest the slightest stir or murmur should send him up, with the speed of an arrow flight, into the farthest blue of the sky. Finally, when he had had enough of rolling over and over, Pegasus turned himself about, and, indolently, like any other horse, put out his forelegs in order to rise from the ground, and Bellerophon, who had guessed that he would do so, darted suddenly from the thicket and leapt astride of his back. Yes, there he sat, on the back of the winged horse. But what a bound did Pegasus make when, for the first time, he felt the weight of a mortal man upon his loins, a bound indeed, before he had time to draw breath, Bellerophon found himself five hundred feet aloft and still shooting upward while the winged horse snorted and trembled with terror and anger. Upward he went, up, 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 until he plunged into the cold, misty bosom of a cloud at which, only a little while before, Bellerophon had been gazing and fancying it a very pleasant spot. And then again, out of the heart of the cloud, Pegasus shot down like a thunderbolt, as if he meant to dash both himself and his rider headlong against a rock. Then he went through with about a thousand of the wildest caprioles that had ever been performed either by a bird or a horse. I cannot tell you half that he did. He skimmed straight forward and sideways and backward. He reared, he reared himself erect with his forelegs on a wreath of mist and his hind legs on nothing at all. He flung out his heels behind and put down his head between his legs with his wings pointing right upward. At about two miles height above the earth, he turned a somerset so that Bellerophon's heels were where his head should have been, and he seemed to look down into the sky instead of up. He twisted his head about, and, looking Bellerophon in the face, with fire flashing from his eyes, made a terrible attempt to bite him. He fluttered his pinions so wildly that one of the silver feathers was shaken out, and floating earthward was picked up by the child, who kept it as long as he lived, in memory of Pegasus and Bellerophon. But the latter, who, as you may judge, was as good a horseman as ever galloped, had been watching his his opportunity, and at last, and at last, clapped the golden bit of the enchanted bridle between the winged steed's jaws. No sooner was this done than Pegasus became as manageable as if he had taken food all his life out of Bellerophon's hand. To speak what I really feel, it was almost a sadness to see so wild a creature grow suddenly so tame, and Pegasus, Pegasus seemed to feel it so likewise. He looked round to Bellerophon, with the tears in his beautiful eyes, instead of the fire that so recently flashed from them. But when Bellerophon patted his head, and spoke a few authoritative, authoritative, yet kind and soothing words, another look came into the eyes of Pegasus, for he was glad at heart, after so many lonely centuries, to have found a companion and a master. Thus it always is with winged horses, and with all such wild and solitary creature. Thus it always is with winged horses, and with all such wild and solitary creatures. If you can catch and overcome them, it is the surest way to win their love. 
While Pegasus had been doing his utmost to shake Bellerophon off his back, he had flown a very long distance, and they had come within sight of a lofty mountain by the time the bit was in his mouth. Bellerophon had seen this mountain before, and knew it to be Helicon, on the summit of which was the winged horse's abode. Thither, after looking gently into his rider's face, as if to ask leave, Pegasus knew, now flew, and, alighting, waited patiently until Bellerophon should please to dismount. The young man, accordingly, leapt from his steed's back, but still held him fast by the bridle. Meeting his eyes, however, he was so affected by the gentleness of his aspect, and by the thought of the, the free life which Pegasus had heretofore lived, that he could not bear to keep him a prisoner, if he really desired his liberty. Obeying this generous impulse, he slipped the enchanted bridle off the head of Pegasus, and took the bit from his mouth. Bit from his mouth. Leave me, Pegasus, said he. Either leave me, or love me. And here is an illustration, and it says, A thousand miles a day was an easy pace. And it has it has Bellerophon sitting on the on the Pegasus, and it shows the bridle on him, and the horse's mouth is open. Leave me, Pegasus, said he. Either leave me or love me. In an instant, the winged horse shot almost out of sight, soaring straight upward from the summit of Mount Helicon. Being long after sunset, it was now twilight on the mountain top and dusky, dusky evening over all the country round, it, round about. But Pegasus flew so high that he overtook the departed day, and was bathed in the upper radiance of the sun. Ascending higher and higher, he looked like a bright speck, and at last could no longer be seen in the hollow waste of the sky. And Bellerophon was afraid that he should never behold him more. But while he was lamenting his own folly, the bright speck reappeared and drew nearer and nearer until it descended lower than the sunshine. And behold, Pegasus had come back. After this trial, there was no more, more fear of the winged horses making his escape. He and Bellerophon were friends and put loving faith in one another. That night they lay down and slept together, with Bellerophon's arm about the neck of Pegasus, not as a caution, but for kindness, and they awoke at peep of day, and bade one another good morning, each in his own language. In this manner, Bellerophon and the wondrous steed spent several days, and grew better acquainted and fonder of each other all the time. They went on long aerial journeys, and sometimes ascended so high that this earth looked hardly bigger than the moon. They visited distant countries and amazed the inhabitants, who thought that the young, that the beautiful young man on the back of the winged horse must have come down out of the sky. A thousand miles a day was no more than an easy space for the fleet, pe for the fleet Pegasus to pass over. Bellerophon was delighted with this kind of life and would have liked nothing better than to live always in the same way, aloft in the clear atmosphere. For it was always sunny weather up there, however cheerless and rainy it might be in the lower region. But he could not forget the horrible chimera, which he had promised King Iobates to slay. So at last, when he had become well accustomed to feats of horsemen, for horsemanship in the air, and could manage Pegasus with the least motion in his hand, and had taught him to obey his voice, he determined to attempt the performance of this perilous adventure. At daybreak, therefore, as soon as he unclosed his eyes, he gently pinched the winged horse's ear in order to arouse him. Pegasus immediately started from the ground and pranced about a quarter of a mile aloft and made a grand sweep around the mountain top by way of showing that he was wide awake and ready for any kind of excursion. During the whole of this little flight, he, he uttered a loud, brisk, and melodious neigh and finally came down at Bellerophon's side, as lightly as ever you saw a sparrow hop upon a twig. "'Well done, dear Pegasus, well done, my sky-skimmer,' cried Bellerophon, fondly stroking the horse's neck. "'And now, my fleet and beautiful friend, we must break our fast. Today we are to fight the terrible Chimera.' As soon as they had eaten their morning meal, and drank some sparkling water from a spring called Hippo... Hippocrene, Pegasus held out his he his head of his own accord, so that his master might put on the bridle. Then, with a great many playful leaps and airy caperings, he showed his impatience to be gone. While Bellerophon was, was girding on his sword and hanging his shield about his neck, 
and preparing himself for battle. When everything was ready, the rider mounted and, as was his custom when going a long distance, ascended five miles perpendicularly so as the better to see whither he was directing his course. He then turned the head of Pegasus towards the east and set out for Lycia. In their fl flight, they overtook an eagle and came so nigh him before he could get out of their way that Bellerophon might easily have caught him by the leg. Hastening onward at this rate, it was still early in the, in the forenoon when they beheld the lofty mountains of Lycia, Lycia with their deep and shaggy valleys. If Bellerophon had been told truly, it was in one of those dismal valleys that the hideous chimera had taken up its abode. Being now so near their journey's end, the winged horse gradually descended with his rider, and they took advantage of some clouds that were floating over the mountain tops in order to conceal themselves. Hovering on the upper surface of a cloud and peeping over its edge, Bellerophon had a pretty distinct view of the mountainous part of Lycia, and could look into all of its shadowy veils at once. At first there appeared to be nothing remarkable. It was a wild, savage, and rocky tract of high and precipitous hills. In the more level part of the country, there were the ruins of houses that had been burnt, and here and there the carcasses of dead cattle strewn about the pastures where they had been feeding. The chimera must have done this mischief, thought Bellerophon, but where can the monster be? As I have already said, there was nothing remarkable to be detected at first sight in any of the valleys and dells that lay among the precipitous heights of the mountains. Nothing at all, unless, indeed, it were three spires of black smoke, which issued from what seemed to be the mouth of a cavern, and clambered sullenly into the atmosphere. Before reaching the mountain top, these three black smoke wreaths mingled themselves into one. The cavern was almost directly been beneath the winged horse and his rider, at the distance of about a thousand feet. The smoke, as it crept heavily upward, had an ugly, sulfurous, stifling scent, which caused Pegasus to snort and Bellerophon to sneeze. So disagreeable was it to the marvelous steed, who was accustomed to breathe only the purest air, that he waved his wings and shot half a, shot half a mile under the range of this offensive vapor. But, on looking behind him, Bellerophon saw something that induced him to f induced him first to draw the bridle and then to turn Pegasus about. He made a sign which the winged horse understood and sunk slowly through the air until the hoofs were scarcely more than a man's height above the rocky bottom of the valley. In front, as far off as you could throw a stone, was the cavern's mouth with the three smoke wreaths oozing out of it. And what else did Bellerophon behold there? There seemed to be a heap of strange and terrible creatures curled up within the cavern. Their bodies lay so close together that Bellerophon could not distinguish them apart. But, judging by their heads, one of these creatures was a huge snake, and a second a fierce lion, and a third an ugly goat. The lion and the goat were asleep. The snake was broad awake and kept staring around him with a great pair of fiery eyes. But, and this was the most wonderful part of the matter, the three spires of smoke evidently issued from the nostrils of these three heads. So strange was the spectacle that, though Bellerophon had been all along expecting it, the truth did not immediately occur to him, that here was the terrible three-headed chimera, he had found out the chimera's cavern. The snake, the lion, and the goat, as he supposed them to be, were not three separate creatures, but one monster. The wicked, hateful thing, slumbering as two-thirds of it were, it still held in its abominable claws the remnant of an unfortunate lamb, or possibly, but I hate to think so, it was a dear little boy which its three mouths had been gnawing before two of them fell asleep. All at once, Bellerophon started as from, a, as from a dream and knew it to be the chimera. Pegasus seemed to know it at the same instant and sent forth a neigh that sounded like the call of a trumpet to battle. At this sound, the three heads reared themselves erect and belched out great flashes of flame. 
And before Bellerophon had time to consider what to do next, the monster flung itself out of the tavern and sprung straight towards him, with its immense claws extended and its snaky tail twisting itself venomously behind. If Pegasus had not been as nimble as a bird, both he and his rider would have been overthrown by the chimera's, he chimera's headlong rush, and thus the battle would ha the battle have and thus the battle have been ended before it was well begun. But the winged horse was not to be caught so. In the twinkling of an eye, he was up aloft, halfway to the clouds, snorting with anger. He shuddered too, not with a fright, but with utter disgust at the loathsome and poisonous thing with the th with three heads. The chimera, on the other hand, raised itself up so as to stand absolutely on the tip end of its tail, with its talons pawing fiercely in the air, and its three heads spluttering fire at Pegasus and his rider. My stars! How it roared and hissed and bellowed! Bellerophon, meanwhile, was fitting his shield on his arm and drawing his sword. Now, my beloved Pegasus, he whispered in the winged horse's ear, thou must help me to slay this insufferable monster, or else thou shalt fly back to the solitary mountain peak without thy friend Bellerophon. For either the chimera dies, or its three mouths shall gnaw this head of mine, which has slumbered upon thy neck. Pegasus whinnied, and, turning back his head, rubbed his nose tenderly against his rider's cheek. It was his way of telling him that, though he had wings and was an immortal horse, yet he would perish if it were possible for immortality to perish, rather than leave Bellerophon behind. I thank you, Pegasus, answered Bellerophon. Now then, let us make a dash at the monster. Uttering these words, he shook the bridle, and Pegasus darted down a slant, as swift as the flight of an arrow, right towards the chimera's threefold head, which, all this time, was poking itself as high as it could into the air. As he came within arm's length, Bellerophon made a cut at the monster, but was carried onward by his steed, before he could see whether the blow had been successful. Pegasus continued his course, but soon wheeled round, at about the same distance from the chimera as before. Bellerophon then perceived that he had cut the goat's head off, the goat's head of the monster almost off, so that it dangled downward by the skin, and seemed quite dead. But, to make amends, the snake's head and the lion's head had taken all the fierceness of of the dead one into themselves, and spit flame, and hissed, and roared with a vast deal more fury than before. Never mind, my brave Pegasus, cried Bellerophon. With another stroke like that, we will stop either its hissing or its roaring. And again he shook the bridle. Dashing a slantwise, as before, the winged horse made another arrow flight towards the kite the chimera, and Bellerophon aimed another downright, downright stroke at one of the two remaining heads as he shot by. But this time, neither he nor Pegasus escaped so well as at first. With one of its claws, the chimera had been, had given the young man a deep scratch in his shoulder, and had slightly damaged the left wing of the flying steed with the other. On his part, Bellerophon had mortally wounded the lion's head of the monster, insomuch that it now hung downward, with its fire almost extinguished, and sending out gasps of thick black smoke. The snake's head, however, which was the only one now left, was twice as fierce and venomous as ever before, and belched forth shoots of fire five hundred yards long, and emitted hisses so loud, so harsh, and so ear-piercing, that King Iobates heard them fifty miles off, and trembled till the throne shook under him. Well, a day, thought the poor king, the chimera is certainly coming to devour me. Meanwhile, Pegasus had again paused in the air, and neighed angrily, while sparkles of a pure crystal flame darted out of his eyes. How unlike the lurid fire of the chimera, the aerial steed spirit was all aroused, and so was that of Bellerophon. Dost thou bleed, my immortal horse, cried the young man, caring less for his own hurt than for the anguish of this glorious creature that ought never to have tasted pain. The execrable chimera shall pay for this mischief with his last head. 
Then he shook the bridle, shouted, lo shouted loudly, and guided Pegasus, not as slantwise as before, but straight at the monster's hideous front. So rapid was the onset that it seemed but a dazzle and a flash before Bellerophon was at close grips with his enemy. And the Chimera, by this time, after losing its second head, had got into a red-hot passion of pain and rampant rage. It so flounced about, half on earth and partly in the air, that it was impossible to see which element it rested upon. It opened its snake jaws to such an abominable width that Pegasus might almost, I was going to say, have flown right down its throat, wings outspread, rider and all. At their approach, it shot out a vent. It shot out a tremendous blast of its fiery breath and enveloped Bellerophon and his steed in a perfect atmosphere of flame, singeing the wings of Pegasus, scorching off one whole side of the young man's golden ringlets and making them both far hotter than was comfortable from head to foot. But this was nothing to what followed. When the airy rush of the winged horse had brought him within the distance of a hundred yards, the chimera gave a spring and flung its huge, awkward, venomous, and utterly detestable carcass right upon poor Pegasus, clung round him with might and main, and tied up its snaky tail into a knot. Up flew the aerial steed, higher, 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 above the mountain peaks, above the clouds, and almost out of sight of the solid earth. But still the earth-born monster kept its hold and was borne upward along with the creature of light and air. Bellerophon, meanwhile, turning around, found himself face to face with the ugly grimness of the chimera's visage, and could only avoid being scorched to death or bitten right in twain by holding up his shield. Over the upper edge of the shield, he looked sternly into the savage eyes of the monster. But the chimera was so mad and wild with pain that it did not guard itself so well as might else have, as might else have been in the case. Perhaps, after all, the best way to fight a chimera is by getting as close to it as you can. In its efforts to stick its horrible iron claws into its enemy, the creature left its own breast quite exposed, and, perceiving this, Bellerophon to rest his sword up to the hilt into its cruel heart. Immediately the snaky tail untied its knot. The monster let go its hold of, pers of its hold of Pegasus and fell from that vast height downward, while the fire within its bosom, instead of being put out, burned fiercer, fiercer than ever and quickly began to consume the dead carcass. Thus it fell out of the sky, all aflame. It being nightfall before it reached, and it being nightfall before it reached the earth was mistaken for a shooting star or a comet. But at early sunrise, some cottagers were going to their day's labor and saw, to their astonishment, that several, acre, several acres of ground were strewn with black ashes. In the middle of the field, there was a heap of whitened bones, a great deal higher than a haystack. Nothing else was ever seen of the dreadful chimera. And when Bellerophon had won the victory, he bent forward and kissed Pegasus, while the tears stood in his eyes. Back now, my beloved steed, said he, back to the fountain of Pyrene. Pegasus skimmed through the air, quicker than ever he did before, and reached the fountain in a very short time. And there he found the old man leaning on his staff, and the country fellow watering his cow, and the pretty maiden filling her pitcher. I remember now, quoth the old man, I saw this winged horse once before, when I was quite a lad, but he was ten times handsomer in those days. I own a cart horse worth three of him, said the country fellow. If this pony were mine, the first thing I should do would be to clip his wings. But the poor maiden said nothing, for she had always the luck to be afraid at the wrong time. So she ran away and let her pitcher tumble down and broke it. "'Where's the gentle child?' asked Bellerophon, "'who used to keep me company, and never lost his faith, "'and never was weary of gazing into the fountain.' "'Here am I, dear Bellerophon,' said the child softly, "'for the little boy had spent day after day on the margin of Pyrene, "'waiting for his friend to come back. "'But when he perceived Bellerophon descending through the clouds, "'mounted on the winged horse, he had shrunk back into the shrubbery.' He was a delicate and tender child, and dreaded lest the old man and the country fellow should see the tears gushing from his eyes. Thou 
hast won the victory, said he, joyfully running to the knee of Bellerophon, who still sat on the back of Pegasus. I knew thou wouldst. Yes, dear child, replied Bellerophon, alighting from the winged horse, but if thy, but if thy faith had not helped me, I should never have waited for Pegasus, and never have gone up above the clouds, and never have conquered the terrible Chimera. Thou, my beloved little friend, hast done it all, and now let us give Pegasus his liberty. So he slipped off the enchanted bridle from the head of the marvelous steed. Be free forevermore, my Pegasus, cried he, with a shade of sadness in his voice. Be as free as, as thou art fleet. But Pegasus rested his head on Bellerophon's shoulder, and would not be persuaded to take flight. Well then, said Bellerophon, grasping the airy horse, thou shalt be with me as long as thou wilt, and we will go together forthwith, and tell King Iobates that the Chimera is destroyed. Then Bellerophon embraced the gentle child, and promised to come to him again, and departed. But... In after years, that child took higher flights upon the aerial steed than ever did Bellerophon, and achieved more honorable deeds than his friend's victory over the Chimera. For, gentle, gentle and tender as he was, he grew to be a mighty poet. And that is the end of the Chimera uh, by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Thank you for joining me for, um, for a story from Myths from Many Lands, and I hope that you join me for many more. Thank you, and have a great day.